Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video we're going to look at the question, when does ageing really begin? Now, short answer, we don't really know, but long answer, going into some detail about the two examples of rejuvenation and introducing the concept of ground zero, the lowest biological age at which both organismal life and ageing begin. And then talking about lowering ground zero is what you'll get if you watch the rest of this video. And so a lot of what I'll be talking about in this video has come from this recent opinion piece that I read, The Ground Zero of Organismal Life and Aging, that I found pretty interesting, so I thought I'd share it here. So I'll start with the question, what do you have in common with a car? Well, cars and other inanimate objects age over time, like we do. However, for cars, this aging is irreversible, whilst rejuvenation is a process that can distinguish living organisms from inanimate objects. And this enables life to continually renew itself with each generation. Now, there are many different ways that you could define rejuvenation, but one way is to define rejuvenation as an ability to lower the biological age. Now, what defines biological age really is a video of its own, but if we can agree that biological age represents the percentage of ageing, and throw chronological age out of the window, then I think it's fair to say, if you want to know when ageing begins, you need to define at what point biological age is the lowest. And so in this opinion piece, they define this lowest point as ground zero. So when does ground zero actually occur? Well, to understand this, we need to talk about what happens during early embryogenesis. The best place to start is conception, when the egg is fertilised by the sperm. And interestingly, it was initially thought that your gametes, the sperm and egg, were immortal. And this idea dates back to the 19th century when Orgut Weismann proposed the separation of ageless germline and ageing soma. However, considering the time of conception, the human germline has been somewhat metabolically active for two or more decades. And during that time, it must have accumulated some damage, whether it's through metabolic byproducts, genetic mutations, or modified proteins. So whilst gametes may appear biologically younger than other tissues, they still show signs of aging. Therefore, for new life to begin in the same young state as in the previous generation, the zygote must somehow remove this damage and decrease its biological age to the level of the germline age in the previous generation. Therefore, conception is not ground zero. So on our hypothetical graph, if we start at conception, due to the presence of some types of damage, the biological age will not be effectively at ground zero, and so we'll place it around here for now. And so during the very early stages post-conception, the zygote undergoes a variety of different changes. For example, it's been reported that telomeres are extended during this early time period, in addition to the erasing of epigenetic marks and genomic imprinting that's been received from the different gametes. Moreover, the divisions of the early zygote may allow for clearing up and dilution of molecular damage. Now, it's still unclear whether these different processes are linear or they happen gradually or in different waves, or whether there's a, some kind of temporal trajectory to it or how much this process is even regulated. And so just as a brief aside, it would be very interesting to further understand this rejuvenation process as it could help us better understand somatic cell rejuvenation, which I'll come on to a little bit later. Now, we know that this rejuvenation process cannot go on forever, and at some point the trajectories are going to be reversed, and therefore there will be an inflection point, and it's this inflection point that could be considered ground zero, and the authors of this paper hypothesise that this ground zero point corresponds with mid-embryogenesis. And the reason why it's a little bit vague at the moment is partly because studying early embryogenesis is incredibly difficult and it's obviously a very sensitive time. Moreover, especially with human embryos, in the lab, they can only be studied up to 14 days post-conception. However, one of the very interesting points made in this article is that this ground zero state during mid-embryogenesis may correspond with the so-called phylotopic stage, and this is defined as the time point in the development of an animal when it most closely resembles other species. So, second question for this video, take a look at these images. Which one of these early embryos do you think will develop into a human? Picks one? Well, turns out the one that will develop into a human is the one on the far right. And so this phylotypic stage has two implications. 
Firstly, it may mean that results found by studying different model organisms at early embryogenesis could be transferable to human embryogenesis. And this is particularly important given the fact that human embryos don't reach the phylotypic stage until four weeks after fertilization. The second implication is that this phylotypic stage may be representing the ground zero state, as it suggests that this stage is evolutionarily conserved and therefore very important. Now, another really interesting point made in this article is the fact that they suggest the biological age at ground zero must be above zero. That's to say the biological age never effectively reaches zero. And there seem to be two key points to support this. Firstly, during early embryogenesis, when the biological age appears to be decreasing, there isn't any selective pressure to decrease it any further beyond doing what is required or essential for further development. Suggesting therefore that the damage that isn't removed would only become relevant much later in life when the organism has already passed its genes to its next generation. The second point is that some damage cannot be removed, the most obvious example being genetic mutations. And on from that, it therefore suggests that there could be some heritability of the biological age at ground zero, therefore suggesting as well that there's variance among different individuals within a population, between sexes and across different species. And so given this information, it raises the question, can ground zero be lowered? With the idea that with a lower ground zero, there could be a reduced biological age throughout life, leading to an extended lifespan and health span. And so this article kind of talks about two main ideas to be able to achieve this. The first one is the idea that to get to a lower ground zero, you could extend this early rejuvenation process. And one way that this could be done is by bisecting early embryos, the idea that those cells then have to go through further stages of development before they reach this ground zero state, which could also be this phylotypic stage. The second example they talk about is the fact that at the moment, this rejuvenation state cannot remove genetic mutations. And this is relevant given the fact that apparently human genomes on average have six ultra rare, highly damaging mutations, each accounting for an average decrease of six months of life. And so obviously there'll be a large variation in that that could be implicating lifespan. And so these mutations could effectively be fixed by using different genome editing technologies. Now, whilst it may be possible to do these things, it doesn't mean that they should be done. And the only reason I really talked about it here is due to the fact that we've been talking about ground zero and it just seemed like a natural extension to this discussion. But actually, the more interesting reasons, as I stated earlier, in terms of understanding early rejuvenation processes, goes in line with trying to understand rejuvenation of somatic cells. And so somatic cells refer to cells that aren't your gamete cells. So basically any cell in your body that isn't a sex cell. And so can somatic cells also be rejuvenated? That means reducing the biological age of a somatic cell. Well, yes, the most go-to example now being the rejuvenation of fibroblast cells to so-called induced pluripotent stem cells by the expression of so-called Yamanaka factors, transcription factors that can reverse the state of the somatic cell type to a pluripotent state. Pluripotent referring to the fact that this cell now has the potential to turn into different types of cells. And this discovery by Dr. Shinya Yamanaka back in 2006 pretty much launched a new era of regenerative medicine. And this branch of medicine includes methods to regrow, repair or replace damaged or diseased cells and includes the generation of therapeutic stem cells, tissue engineering and the production of artificial organs. And another term you may come across when reading about this field is cellular reprogramming because it's the idea that you can reprogram a somatic cell, a cell that's been differentiated, back into a pluripotent stem cell-like state. And a lot of research is being conducted into using cellular reprogramming in different therapies. And I mentioned work from the David Sinclair lab last year whereby they showed that they could use cellular reprogramming to restore fission in aged mice. And so in this manner, the aging process is effectively reversed because the biological age of those cells gets reduced. And so the last main point that I want to touch upon from this article is how we can kind of think of cellular reprogramming as a potentially more advanced version of the current approaches to try and delay the aging process. And so the author describes these interventions, such as senolytics and metabolic manipulation, as partial reprogramming stating that although these approaches are extremely important and may somewhat decrease the biological age, they may only represent fragmentary or partial rejuvenation strategies. 
And a good way to try and understand this is through an analogy whereby ageing is akin to gravity, whereby it's a fundamental force of nature that can never truly be reversed, whereby geroprotective therapies could slow down this flow, like the way that canals can slow down rivers, but can never reverse it. On the other hand, rejuvenation technologies could be thought of as water pumps. And to use a different analogy, this time rocket science, If ageing in biology is akin to gravity in rocket science, then if rockets can fly and escape Earth's grips without actually reversing gravity, then there's hope that by further understanding rejuvenation and early development and beyond could help us to better understand the underlying biochemical mechanisms that underpin rejuvenation that will have great potential for different therapeutic uses. So with that, I hope you've learned something in this video. A big shout out to all my Patreon supporters. And thank you for listening.